Welcome to the CodeCast Podcast. Real-world insights for your daily medical coding and billing processes. And now, here's your host, Terry Fletcher. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CodeCast Podcast today. My name is Terry Fletcher. I hope everyone is having a good July. Uh, One of the things I wanted to go over today is that on July 10th, CMS put out their 2025 Medicare Physician Fee Schedule proposed proposed rule, and I really just wanted to get it to everyone. I mentioned a couple of things last week, but there's some things that you may not be aware of that are coming up as far as January 1st, 2025, and you have to read through the proposed rule to actually understand it. For those of you that don't want to spend, you know, that many hours reading through all of it, I will, but you don't have to. You can also go to the cms.gov forward slash newsroom forward slash fact sheets, and you can find what they have out there for July 10th. But I'm just going to give you some of the rundown so that you know what's coming so that you can bring it to your physician's attention. Also, for more information on this, I will have my third quarter CMS Medicare update webinars that will be in September. So make sure that you look for those because then that comes with cited references and information from the PowerPoint. But first, the CodeCast podcast is also brought to you by Decision Health. Join Decision Health this November for the Advanced Specialty Coding Virtual Summit. Dive into orthopedics, pain management, and anesthesia specialties, and get the latest guidance for accurate coding, billing, and compliance. Visit codebooks.com forward slash events to register. Save $50 with coupon code ASC2024. Okay, so let's take a look at what CMS is, and I hate to say this, doing to us in 2025. And you know, one thing that's really tough, and you need to be very, very aware of this, is that in an election year, when this proposed rule comes out, I notice that they don't always listen to us in the comments, but you still need to put your comments in there, make sure they know that your physician is on top of it. But also they slide things in that you may not be aware of and they don't fix things that we've been asking them to fix. And so it's just important that you understand what's going to be happening because we have some pay cuts coming and it's not going to be pretty. So the proposed rule that again announces and solicits public comments on proposed policy changes for Medicare under the physician fee schedule and other Part B issues is going to be effective on January 1st, 2025. Now, can some of these things be rolled back or changed or modified if we have a change in administration? Absolutely. So that could also impact what happens here. But for the most part, this is the regulatory change that we're going to see. And the, one of the things that the current administration talks about is equitable health care systems to you know, try to give better accessibility, quality, affordability, and all that. The problem is, is that many of us, our money is tied up in e services. And when you try to balance a budget and you've got the, the balanced budget rules when it comes to the Medicare fee schedule, anything that you add is taken away from the value of our E&M services. And you've seen that quite a bit. And then anything you add procedurally is taken away from our surgery services. So there's some things there that when they how, how do I put this? It's kind of a fallacy where they tell you, oh, we're actually doing you a favor when actually they're not. So um, I hate to be so harsh, but when we're right now looking at a fee schedule in 2024, that's like into 1972. And now it looks like it's going to go down to 1970 plus all the deductions we take from sequestration and, you know, those relief packages they say they put out, they always attack the Medicare fee schedule. And I personally am getting tired of it. So you're going to hear me rant a little bit here. So since 1992, Medicare payment has been made under the physician uh, fee schedule for services of physicians and other billing professionals that can get reimbursed under Part B. Uh, physician services paid under the physician fee schedule can not is not just physician uh, offices. It can be some hospital services that's not facility, uh, some ambulatory surgical centers, skilled nursing facilities, and other acute post care settings. So make sure that you're aware of some of that because if it's facility specific, that's part A. But with where it's not institutional payment is made, then we also have some technical services and some suppliers, clinical laboratories outpatient dialysis services, a lot of that's also under uh, Part B as well. And so here's what we're, we're looking at, uh, especially because many diagnostic tests 
and a limited number of other services under the physician fee schedule, separate payment may be made for professional and technical components of services. But again, it's taking away from other services because these RVUs uh, that have this conversion factor, which is our multiplier against the value of the code, um, can adjust based on geographic location because of practice cost indices um, and vary cost by, you know, not just geographics, but also uh, overall payment issues updated by the statute. So here's what is basically looking at going into effect. So the average payment rate under the physician fee schedule is proposed to be reduced by 2.93%. I'm losing my mind here. And so what that means is that you are looking at, um, oh, and also a relatively, they call it a relatively small estimated 0.05% adjustment for changes in work values. And when they say relatively small, on what scale? I mean, we're, we're trying to get money here and to protect our Medicare patients. But here is, it says the amount proposed estimated calendar year 2025 fee schedule conversion factor is going from, is from what we have now at 33.29 to a decrease of about 93 cents, which is 32.36 or 2.8%. And so the, the, it's not good. And what they're doing is they're uh, adding, you know, care tra caregiver training services, um, which I don't think it's a problem to add that, but I wish they would add that as under the scope of maybe a nurse visit. That way we wouldn't lose money, but to create new codes that need new pricing, it takes away from our current codes. And so, and the other thing I don't like is they're saying that this could be, you know, people that don't have a special certification. It can include, include just somebody, you know, special diet preparation or um, somebody that is, lives next door to the patient. Again, they're just deemed a caregiver instead of an actual uh, certified clinical person. And they're also proposed that it could be furnished under telehealth. And I'm like, okay, why don't you just open up all kinds of bad actors for phone calls for this. So that's a problem. I, I really hope that you look at that and complain. <laughs> that doesn't really make me happy when I hear that stuff. Some of the um, people were asking about the G2211 code. We're having a hard time right now with the add-on code for the complexity. I know United Healthcare said they're not gonna pay for it anymore as of September 1st. Um, Aetna and some, I think it was, um, what was it, Cigna came out and said as of July 1st, they're paring it down. So one of the things that was proposed for 2025 for the G2211 add-on code is say, basically saying that they may allow it same day as the annual well visit. Um, and one thing that actually might be helpful is they may allow it with the vaccine administration or any Part B preventative service in the office or outpatient setting, only because right now when you add a 25 modifier to any e &M code and you need that, if you also bill a vaccine, then it would get negated. And it looks like this proposal would, would stop that in certain circumstances. So that's one plus, but just know there are commercial plans that are saying this has been excessive. And I think when the data comes in for Medicare, they're gonna say the same thing. They expected this to be billed by primary care about 38% of the time. Well, when you add in what specialty offices have been doing, and now I see offices, which I strongly disagree with and, and do not recommend, adding it automatically to every single service. Some are getting in trouble, some are doing it anyway. Uh, it looks like it's about 88% being billed and they don't have the budget for it. And so that, that's really kind of a problem. Another thing under telehealth, they're proposing to add several services on a provisional basis. So again, this might be uh, temporary for INR monitoring and uh, under the caregiver training. And then, but they're also looking at proposing um, frequency limitations for subsequent inpatient visits, um, nursing facility visits and critical care consultations. Actually, it's saying we're proposing to continue the suspension of that, but they're actually considering, I heard that actually has already been um, part of their saying, okay, we're, we're looking to, uh, they didn't mean to say suspension, they meant to, to continue frequency limitations. Um, also, one of the things that they're um, looking at too is it says we're proposing that beginning January 1st, an interactive telecommunication system may include two-way real-time audio only for any telehealth if the distant side physician 
or practitioner is uh, not capable or does not consent to the use of video and so the patient and the, they have a discussion but there has to be a medically medical reason for that and I don't think that that's going to continue um, one of the things that they're proposing is that they will continue to permit the distance site um, to use their currently enrolled practice locations when the address of the physician is at home under certain circumstances a lot of this says under certain circumstances and so those are the things that you really want to take a look at because when you're looking at things that are incident to or being provided by another provider you know the def definition of immediately available is is a problem because if you're doing something virtually and you can't rush into a room for a patient that's why they say you have to be in clinic and they're saying that real-time audio and video is considered immediately available that is crazy to me that is not just a compliance it's a issue it's a malpractice issue and so just because sometimes they're proposing this and to me I think it's a little bit political be very careful with that because it can get you into a lot of trouble and I, I don't like it um, the teaching facility teaching physicians I actually don't mind some of the virtual presence there as long as the you know clinical instances when the service is furnished virtually um, has three-way telehealth so the patient the resident the teaching facility um, so uh, th there's still the requirement there of the teaching facility where it's not just the the resident and the patient and so everything has to be there now one thing I did notice is that we haven't had uh, an update and I thought this was interesting yet as far as making sure that the Consolidated Appropriations Act without an act of Congress for real-time audio and video visits maybe this is why they're proposing these things as of January from what I see because part of the CAA was saying that patients can you know receive services in their home in all geographic areas part of the new rule doesn't say that it says patients must be in an underserved area or go to a facility setting for telehealth so it would go back to pre pandemic rules and so because Medicare has given some of those services a status indicator of invalid if not in the right location and so that's where I think you're gonna find that there's some issues there that may or may not be really recognized one thing that that bothers me on the telehealth side is the fact that we're not getting broadband first before we're saying oh this is what we're covering and so that that can be weird we know we're getting 16 new telehealth codes from the CPT book from AMA and they will be able to be based on medical decision making or time but expect a shift in not just the descriptive description but also in the reimbursement there whenever you see a new Hicks picks code so a new code that you know G code and or e any kind of CPT code that has X in the code descriptor or an X in numerical five digits make sure you know that's a placeholder that's not a final code so you have to be very co cognitive of that because I see some people saying oh this is our new code and putting it in the um, system and that's actually not what it is so I don't want you to get caught flat-footed with that and then um, one of the other things that I've seen too is that strategies for improving global surgery payment looks like there's going to be some modifications of 90-day global surgery packages uh, when another practitioner in a, in a group practice furnishes part of the global package another one re, uh, re furnishes another part you know also I wanted to there was something that came to my attention uh, this week on my coding corner membership and I wanted to bring this up because I thought it was an interesting question and my good friend Christine Hall in, out of Florida she does this uh, dissection and anatomy of a CPT code webinar and I just love it because she goes over every aspect not just payment not just definition not just intent but we were talking about status indicators so every code with Medicare as a status indicator can it be used for surgery can it be used for under incident to rules can you know is it inpatient outpatient etc and when you do a surgery let's say for example you implant a pacemaker and that has a 90-day global period and then I've had some providers say well I want to bring the patient in in the post-op period and have my RNs or my medical assistants just look at all the staple areas the wound checks and so I can go do bigger ticket items and I'm like wait 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 and you know Christine and I were having a chat about this and I thought this was a good point remember that 
90 day global period surgeries, the reason they're there is because 20 to 30% of that global period RVU, that whole, I should say that global code, including the surgery and the 90 days out after the surgery, includes E&M values of either level twos or level threes and level fours. And nurses can't do that. Medical assistants can't do that. So you can't have your RNC patients for that. What if there's an infection? What if there's something that requires a return to the OR? They can't make that medical decision. So they're not really coming in for a free visit. They're coming in for the e &M service that you already got paid for, your physician got paid for. And that is not under, it's not a, a status indicator of being able to be um, incident too. So keep that in mind when you try to get around things to try to make a little more money because that, that can be a problem. Just make sure you look at behavioral health is going to get some more proposals, but they're looking at proposing a monthly billing code that requires specific protocols in furnishing post-discharge follow-up contacts that are performed in conjunction with a discharge for maybe the emergency department for a crisis center. Um, as a bundled service describing four calls in a month. So I know that's been a really big deal and I actually liked the write up on this. So let, we'll keep that in mind and keep looking for that. Um, there's some things under the hospital in and outpatient add on for infectious diseases. Uh, that might be a specific element for infectious disease physicians, but they have to have a specific certification with specialized training in infectious diseases. So it can't just be like what they're allowing for some behavioral health right now saying, hey, guess what? You're, you can do this service. No, you have to be careful with that. There's going to be some supervision policies adjusted for physical therapists and OTs um, that we have to pay, pay attention to. They may allow for general supervision for physical therapy assistance and, and OTAs, occupational therapy assistance by uh, private practice um, providers. So just be aware that there's some things there. It will not um, be something in an in institutional setting that'll be allowed, but possibly in the doctor's office. And they're going to be asking for some certification, recertification uh, regulations to be adjusted for the administrative burden for therapists but they will lower your fees if this passes. So, you know, they want to provide an exception to the physician or NPP uh, as far as a signature requirement on a therapist established treatment plan for purposes of the initial certification of care when there's a referral. But if they allow this, they're going to uh, lower the fee schedule on, on that and lower the reimbursement because again, if it doesn't met, how do you prove it's medically necessary? The physician doesn't sign off on that treatment plan or that referral. So some of these things that they're doing, it's just, I, I just shake my head and, and I'm hoping the comments and the feedback from physicians aren't like, Oh, thanks for the free money. Instead, they're like, what are you thinking? Because that doesn't make sense at all to do those kinds of things. So there's going to be some payment adjustments for radio pharmaceuticals in the physician's office, and they're going to exact some methodologies that actually are more in line with the actual uh, retail costs of nuclear and Lexican, Lexiscan, things like that. Because right now, I know a lot of physicians that do nuclear medicine in their office, they're getting absolutely you know, hosed on what they're getting reimbursed for that. So those are just a couple of the highlights I wanted to give you. There's all kinds of other things coming out with rural health clinics and um, you know some things of telecommunications there, some payment for preventative vaccine costs and just some uh, dental and oral health, some things that may be added to Medicare, which again, take away from things that we already were really happy to get payment for, really you know, expecting payment on. So just keep all these things in mind because not everything is good news. If it takes away from your bread and butter and your actual you know, services that you're doing every day, that's absolutely you know, a problem. So for my personal tidbit right now, so those of you that are going out in the sun or, you know, I try to swim every day. I've been really on this health kick lately and I've been in every day, single day since it's really stopped raining here, uh, April 12th. And I'm very good about sunscreen. I'm an Irish girl, so I, I can, I can get sunburned in my house. <laughs> it's not good, but now I feel like I'm one big freckle, but, uh, just make sure that you are using sunblock instead of sunscreen. I kind of missed a couple of places on my neck and back last week and it hurts. It doesn't feel good. Oh, and if you have any kind of 
um, I don't want to say bald spot, but if you have any sensitive areas on your head that isn't completely covered with hair, you might want to spray your head. So just look at that too. For those of you that, are, that color your hair, make sure you be careful of some of the, they call them the hair sprays for the sun because they can turn your hair a different color. Um, but I've just noticed that Banana Boat and Copper Tone are fine because I have to spray my head on some areas because it's just so hot uh, sometimes in California. And I know those of us in that have ever been to Hawaii run into the same thing. But just be careful out there with the sun and the heat and hydrate and just try not to uh, make your skin leather too quick. We're only in July, so we have a lot of uh, summer left to go. My last thing I am going to say is, you know, my condolences, my heartfelt, just I'm so happy that, you know, it wasn't worse than it was for President, former President Trump and you know the the attempt on his life and I, I just my heart goes out to his family many of you know i'm a conservative so my heart stopped at that moment that that really could happen here in the u.s that's all i'm going to say about that because I, I really try not to be too political um, but that should not happen here and i really hope we don't see any more of that up through election day so everyone have a great rest of your week make it a great day and thank you for listening to the codecast podcast for more information on medical coding billing auditing and compliance, including how to hire Terry, follow Terry on Twitter at TerryCoder1 or visit her website at www.terryfletcher.net. Podcast producer Joe Kuzma, music producer Assassin Music.